Wow. You see, see the slide up there, what it says? What's it say in big words? Holy Spirit. So I think there's a, a fake humility and then a real humility. And so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about this, but also a little bit scared to death. Because I'm aware that, um, in essence, if any time we venture to try to take on something as amazing as the Holy Spirit, it's almost like taking a box, a container, and every one of us would love nothing more than to understand everything and for it to fit in the confines of our understanding, which could represent any type of container or box. But anytime we venture to understand something beyond and greater and bigger and more complicated than our understanding, it's like taking something really large, right, and trying to shove it into a, a finite, like, container and it, it, it doesn't work and so for me to say I feel like the Lord wants me to talk to you about the Holy Spirit I know I, I'm kind of doing this um, and so that is and I'm sure that if I come back and I listen to what I say today and, and in the coming weeks at least I would hope in 10 years from now I'd say Will you had no idea then <laughs> what you know now and that's not a bad thing. That, that's my hope. So I want you to understand my heart because I want you to join me on this. What, what God has shown me is we, we choose books of the Bible and we're going through those books. And it's been super powerful. And if you've been with us for any amount of time or any part of a congregation of believers who does that, you'll be amazed how much that God coordinates it's chapter 3, verse 12, and you're like, how could God coordinate chapter 3, verse 12 with De December 15th, 2016? Because those two went together like a puzzle piece. But he does it, and it amazes me. But it always comes back to, my friends, this, this fact of the Holy Spirit. And so before I arbitrarily or prayerfully start thinking about where to go next in, in my box, the Lord's like, listen, I want, I want you to go on a journey. So I won't call it a sermon series because I don't know how many weeks it's going to be yet. But my prayer is that we can begin to discover more about the Holy Spirit together, but, but not to learn about him, but to know him. To know him. And I'll trust him to apply this to your heart because I am aware there's, there's a wide varieties of opinions of the Holy Spirit based on where you've come from before this day, okay? Let's, let's just prayerfully enter this. Heavenly Father, we just pray that your will be done and that your plan um, just keeps going as it is, Lord. There's so many things we can worry about, but we have to come back to your will, Lord, that you have a plan and a will, and you are saving the world through the Lord Jesus Christ from sin and death and reuniting and reunifying your sons and daughters to you. Lord, and I just pray, uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your work and for your love and your power and your authority and for your ability to be our friend. And Holy Spirit, the often forgotten member of our Godhead, you are the one that applies. You are the friend. You are the intimate one, the helper, the comforter, the one who speaks to me and leads me. And so I pray that you would work in the hearts of people today, wherever they're at, that you would grow in them um, in understanding and experience of you. I pray this, Jesus, in your name. And in your power, amen. Well, uh, the, the focal verses for today, John 14, I'm going to read to you 15 through 17 and then take a little break and pull in 23 through 26. So if you're taking notes, let's see if it's going to work. No, it's not going to. Okay, Linda, you're with me, right? Okay, here's a couple questions. So what are you up to, Will? Let me just lay this out there for you. I don't want to surprise you. Lots of questions about the Holy Spirit. I don't know that I'll answer them all. I promise you I won't answer them all today. This is enough of, of a you 
this is you, this is the fire hose, right? And you're drinking from the fire hose. I, I don't want to do that to you today. And you to go home all wet, okay? So, but here's some questions. Uh, who is the Holy Spirit? W- what does he do? What's my relationship to him? How do I get filled with him? H- how do I even know if he's in me? Like, how am I supposed to relate to him? Like, do you pray to him or don't you? If I don't speak in tongues, does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? Just, just a few of many questions that some of you have. And a lot of you are like, mm-hmm, I know the answer to this and this and this. That's awesome, okay? But I want you all to join me in laying that down. Laying this down. And, and part of the problem that I see, guys, is, is I don't want to alienate you because I'm fully aware that many of you have been given this faith through congregations and fellowships of, of believers that would call themselves full gospel or, or, or Pentecostal. And then other ones have come from a much more, you know, conservative, spiritually, or liturgical type background. And in, in, in those camps, a lot of us have the same Bible. And it's, it's the same Lord. However, we seem to be divided. And I'll tell you, the frustrating thing for me is I came from a conservative camp. And as the Lord revealed himself to me, as, as the Holy Spirit began, began to like empower me and come into my life, I felt the only refuge was to go to this far left. Hey, read this will, and then pretty soon you start reading it, and you're like, wow, that was as much religion as that was. Where's the truth? And, and that's what I think we should, as sons and daughters of God, as Christians, as believers, want to know the truth want to believe the truth, want, want to live in unity with God, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of us, honestly, it's like, oh, I come in the name of the Father, the Son, we're good with that, and the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like under our breath, it's like the side note, right? Like we don't ever talk about him, do anything with him. There, there's that camp, and then over here, it's like always got to be a mountaintop. I'm either like speaking on tongues or smoking crack, right? And you know it's true. Maybe some of you were this person. And everyone in the middle is just like, you both are crazy because I read the Bible and that's not what that says. And I read the Bible and that's not what that says. And where am I supposed to go? But to bring glory to God, God the Son, and to the Holy Spirit who will help you to understand and apply what it is you read in those scriptures. Fair enough? Okay. First of all, let me take a step back. I'll just pause a second. Because if I rush too much, then we're going to try to get too smart. And flat out, I'm just not smart enough to explain this to you. Do you understand? He is God, I am not, and neither are you. And the minute you minimize him to your understanding, he is no longer God. So let's, let's be careful. I, I want to bring this idea of the Trinity up to you. Which verse is the Trinity found in? The Word. Anyone know? Shaking your head back there? No, it's, it's nowhere, right? What about triune God? First hesitations? No, it's not, no that's not a real book either. It's, it's not in the Bible. This is man's words that we use to describe what we read in the Scripture, that there is God who is three distinct persons but united, right, under one will. And you can try to explain that me, to me till your last breath, and I will tell you I won't understand it. And if you think you can, put that broad, amazing, powerful of a mysterious thing and throw it into your little box, you're lying to yourself. How could that be, Corey, that like God is the Father and the Son I don't know. But the Holy Spirit's been showing me um, your changing and growth and understanding and and, um, experiencing will enter through your mind. The truth comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God, right? You have to hear this truth and then you've got to not stop it from penetrating your understanding and changing you. 
The whole point of this is not for you to know more scripture about the Holy Spirit. I want you to change, whether this is two weeks, two months, 25 years of a journey for you. You should go on this journey, and, and I will too. Like, Holy Spirit, let me know you intimately. Let me walk with you as God. Empower me to do the things that you do. Don't let me get into the traps that men and women have fallen into before me trying to put you in a box. So all that being said, um, let me just tell you, here's a little bit, here's something I, when I'm researching uh, an impression that, that I've been given, the Trinity, maybe this will help. Okay, there's God the Father, right? Heavenly Father. God the Father is, he wills. He plans. It's why Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, right? Like, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's, it's his will that's being carried out. So we, we can relate to the Father. The, the Father's in, in power, in authority, so holy that's why there was all this ritual and stuff to try to get pure enough to get to him. But here was the amazing plan. That wasn't it because he would have been a God that was unreachable and unknowable because he was so holy and set apart the one who wills, the source, the planner. But then there was Jesus, his son, that he sent to become a person, to be personal, to set aside his deity and deal with the flesh and deal with struggles of sin. And so you have Jesus, the son, he's the accomplisher of the will. And that's why we bring him glory. Like, Jesus, you did it. He's the one that did it. He's the doer, the means, the work. But then you have the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is God the Spirit. He is the applier of salvation to believers. He's the one that reports the will of the Father and the work of God the Son. The Holy Spirit is the effector of salvation. It's he who convicts, convinces, and empowers a person to change. By his power, dead things come back to life. The scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit is the one that had the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, Holy Spirit, how, how important is this? Well, lots of questions come with this. Well, the Holy Spirit, is that just a New Testament thing? Right, is that, is that just an after Pentecost thing? Because to be honest with you, um, just to be honest with you, I think a lot of times what I find in a conversation of the Holy Spirit is where do we go to first and foremost? That's right. He, he, he got ahead of me here. He's read the notes. That's good. That's good. Um, where we always go when we, when we start talking about the Holy Spirit is always this contingency or this like bone of contention, I should say, between believers. It's the speaking in tongues thing. It is. It, it really is. It's, it's these, it's miraculous gifts of the Spirit. That's where people always want to go. They always want to debate that. That's the two camps, right? There's the camps who are like, I don't know, that freaks me out, and the camps that are saying that's everything. And this is my experience in Christendom in talking about that. And so some churches, it's like, we don't want to talk about that because people will fight, and other people are like, I've had friends, believers, brothers, and sisters who are like, I was literally locked in a room till I could do this. And I, and I don't know if you have talked to these people, but there is that, like, Holy Spirit, like, literally told me, yeah, we don't really talk about that, too. I was 13, and they told me I wasn't saved because I couldn't speak in tongues, and I, I was in the room crying till midnight. And then the same person saying, but then when I was 23, it just happened to me while I was doing dishes. These, these I give to you not as facts, but as testimonies. Which is your responsibility to one another is that we, we have a reason for our faith. We have a story and a testimony that we share with the world. And so I'm aware both of these things exist, these, these extremes. And so there's a lot of thought about, okay, Pentecost, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, that t t tends to be the bone of contention and Christianity. But the Holy Spirit 
it is so important. He's not part God. He's not like God light, fewer calories, right? No, he is, he's not that. He is from the beginning and the end. So don't just take my word for it. Check this out. Genesis 1. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You can tell by the numbers here, this is the beginning, right? The beginning of what we know is the Bible. In the beginning, okay, it says there, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So Steve, you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit was part of creation? It's probably why God said, and we made them in our image. And all things was created through Jesus, right? The worker, the willer, the worker, the applier. They were all part of that. It wasn't like God took an arm off and threw it down to you to help you as the Holy Spirit. No, this is all of God, and, and I, can't, I don't get it. Was there three chairs, and they were hanging out and made a plan? I, I don't know the way that this works. I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Okay? But what I want to know is, is, is how I relate to him and why he's here, because in your faith, most of us live powerlessly. And even my Pentecostal brothers and sisters, it's not power that they have, it's emotion that they have at times. And your emotions are fickle. And your pride and your strength is weak. And so the Holy Spirit is supposed to do both, right? Sometimes he manifests himself in an extremely emotional and miraculous way. And other times, it is the day after day of the fruits of the Spirit, of being kind, right, and being patient and self-controlled. Self-controlled is not, ah, right? Like, it's not always like that. But can he do that? Yes, the Holy Spirit can do that. So if you're doing that and you're calling it the Holy Spirit, I'm not judging you saying you can't do that. And if you're afraid of him, I'm not judging you and saying, I get why you're afraid, because you saw that person running and jumping on the chairs. The truth of the matter, the unity of the brotherhood, how in the world could a God who says he wants to make us one, and Lord Jesus who would pray things like, God, I'm one with you. Make them one with me as I'm one with you. Why would he pray that, yet he would give us the power to do that, and that would be what divides us? Fighting. No more, God. No, no more. Teach us new. Holy Spirit, guide me, convict me, teach me. Be on a journey. And the best I'm doing is offering this to you. And if you only come Sunday morning and you don't ask the Holy Spirit anything else, you will not change, you will not grow, you will learn nothing. I know, I know in the Christian world it's like, oh, you're either giving me meat or milk, right? And you think the pastor does that. Pastors give you milkshakes. The meat is what you get when you're with the Lord, when you're in fellowship with one another. If you don't meet with any Christians and you come listen to me, Right, Ben, like we said, what's the best? It could be a nugget, right? A nugget for you to chew on, but then you'll be hungry again. So, so take this. In the beginning, the Holy Spirit was there. And then check this out. Well, what about at the end? Did like a time stop? Because there's that kind of belief, like, ah, I don't know. God has a purpose and all that kind of wild stuff. People being healed and raising from the dead, that doesn't happen anymore. Well, there's other scriptures about that. But what I want to show you with the Holy Spirit is this. In Revelation 22, verse 17, it says this. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Why am I showing this to you? I ask you to consider this for two reasons. One, I want you to see that the Holy Spirit didn't like take a PTO day once it all went down. He wasn't reabsorbed into some magical God thing. But secondly, I want you to see his position. Who's he with? The Spirit and the... Who's the bride? What's that? I heard a couple answers there. Us. It's the church. We are the bride of Christ. Get this. When it's all said and done, it's not God up here and the Holy Spirit and all you petty peasants. No. The Holy Spirit is with us, like cowering, like, holy cow, what is happening here? And the glory of God, and like, I can't even look into this. And he's still there with you. 
at the very end. And he's like with us, united voice. He's like, guys, come on. Let me show you what to say. And the Spirit says, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who's thirsty, come. He's like with you to the end, Derek. After all the butt kicking's done, everything's done, he's still next to you. That's awesome. So can, can you agree with me that this Holy Spirit is a significant figure, character, part of God's story and what he's doing here? Can you agree with me? This is crazy confusing for you to try to understand and for you to think it's some ethereal blob, that spirit, and then the Holy Spirit sucks into it. That's not what the Bible shows us. It's not what the prophecy given to John at the end shows us. The dream, the vision, whatever you want to call it, that's not what it shows us. It wasn't magic fairy dust that God put on people to speak in tongues. It's, it's just not. It, it didn't come at Pentecost and like, oh, you need this. There you go. Now heal somebody or pray in tongues or raise from the dead. No. It, the Holy Spirit's more than that. Okay, let's go back to Jesus, right? Because we, we agree on Jesus. Like, almost nobody's got a problem with Jesus. And some people, maybe the raised from the dead thing freaks them out, but, but most of us don't have a problem with what he says and what he believes. So let, let's go to Jesus real quick. Verse, all right, John, it's from John's account. John, who walked with Jesus, was writing about what they'd went through with Jesus, and Jesus was talking to him. John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father. Well, first of all, it's easy to jump over that. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We've been talking about that, right? It's this confusion that we have that because of Jesus, we no longer should do what God asked us to do. And, and that's just not true. That's, that's, that's not true. Like, no longer do you have to do the right thing to get saved, which no one could ever do. Spoiler alert, you can't do it. You can't save yourself. But because you're saved, if you want to love God, then you do the things he's asked you to do. So if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, right? he's separate from the Father. Still, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Can, can we dwell a moment on the weight of this? If you walked with Jesus, use your imagination for a minute. You've walked with this man like flesh that you've seen, you've, you've touched, hugged, and you've seen him do crazy things. Like you were hungry, and he made like bread and fish multiply and appear. Like you could smell somebody that was dead and watch them come back to life. You've been on the sea in a storm where you thought you would die and you saw the dude walk on the water and stop the storm. I mean, that's impressive. I mean, we're impressed with people with bright colored shirts and shiny heads, right, that are afraid to talk. If I'm not careful, you try to deify me just because I do that, right? Imagine if I could walk on water and raise people from the dead. That's, that's this guy. And he's like, oh, guess what? I got to go. Oh, what? <laughs> like, where's the bread and fish going to come from? What about the next storm? What if Billy dies? What's going to happen, Jesus? He's like, I got something better for you. Ooh, this could be good hope, right? Better for me than that. He's like, keep my commandments. Show me that you love me. Keep doing what we're doing. And I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you a helper. And this is going to be far better than what I can do. Because you're not going to go have to find him. Where's Jesus, right? That happened too. Where's Jesus? The crowd's waiting for him. Oh, he's up taking a nap, right? Or the storm's on the boat. What's going on? Jesus is sleeping over here. Like, like, 
He's like, I got something better because I'll sleep, I'll get tired, I'll take off on the mountaintop, and there's like 12 of you and one of me, and I don't even have the time to talk to all of you. So he's like, I got something better. The Father's going to send you this helper, and that helper is going to be with you, within you, all the time. Never sleeping, never on the mountaintop, needing a break. This is better. But here's, here's the thing. He's a spirit, so the world won't know him. They won't receive him. They won't see him, but, but you'll know him. You can know him and be intimately acquainted with him because he's, he's in you and around you and in everyone that you come in contact with. Okay, let's bring this back. Now that I've given you this thing that I'm saying is true, has your experience been that the Holy Spirit was better than if you could just hang out with Jesus? It, it really hasn't for most of us. Most of us in church are always saying, I just wish Jesus was here. I just wish Jesus was here. But we have access to better than that. And so because we're not there, then I would present to you we're missing something. And it's why that everyone's not just standing in here, like standing room only, lines out the door, like beating each other up to get in to hear about this. Because we don't really think it's better, we're not experiencing it's better. And then we, we'll pick back up with verse 23, John 14, the second half of verse 23. And then Jesus says this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So it gets even weirder, right? Because it's like God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are going to make a home with me? If I'm theirs? Well, I mean, it's awesome, but kind of hard to, like, I've read the little book, you know, where, like, Our, what's it, Our Heart, God's Home or something, Brandy, was that what it was called? That was really kind of cool as an idea of, like, you know, your heart, the, the center of you is where, where God lives, and so kind of that exercise of really just being in God's presence and saying, He's with me everywhere I go, and no matter what happens, it's a powerful truth, but very difficult to understand. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. 25, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, there it is again, right? The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring your remembrance all that I have said to you. So he's doing these things, right? The Holy Spirit, the helper, here's what he can do for you. One, he's going to remind you of everything that, that Jesus has already taught you. And some of that is, is his spoken word recorded by those who walked with him. And we call that the Bible, right? We put it together on crazy thin paper that doesn't seem to exist anywhere else in nature. And we put it in a book and we call it the Bible. That's words, right? God's word. But then there's also this, this idea that God is speaking and he's calling his sheep, and he's leading, and, he, and you have experiences and a testimony and stories. And so the Holy Spirit, one of his jobs is he's going to remind you, oh, wait, I remember reading that in John when John said this about Jesus. It totally, I'm seeing it happen in real life. So that's the Holy Spirit, right? He's reminding you of what you've already learned, and, and he's teaching you all the things that you haven't learned yet. So we could talk a lot, a lot of details what's that, what that means, but I think it's interesting that, um, that Jesus said that and yet the people didn't get it. So it's not just us. We've had this. I've had this my whole life and I still could read it a hundred times and I still don't quite get it. And, and neither did they. So back to this idea, okay, the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about it. He was at the beginning He was at the end. The power of God in your life is delivered in these three areas, right? The Father's will, the Son's work, 
and, and right? And then, of course, the application from the Holy Spirit. And so those of us living without the Holy Spirit are, in essence, living with only two-thirds of the power that's available to us. And when you can't use that one foot, it makes a big difference, huh, Jamie? And we've basically, right? And, and that's how we're stumbling through our Christian life. So hopefully you can see how important this is, as much as it might make you uncomfortable to venture into this. So I, I want to tackle s- aspects of, of the Holy Spirit, however many weeks God leads me to do this. Today, here's the, here's the first thing that I want you to take, I want you to consider, because I think when applied, it could change everything. And, and that's this idea um, I didn't come up with it. You could Google it, and there's tons of information that, that smart people, smarter than me, with all these initials after their name, right, having to do with theology, could write about. But, but an important part of, of the reality of the Holy Spirit that I can actually introduce to your mind, that I pray that the Holy Spirit would apply to your heart, is that the Holy Spirit is personal. I've heard it before, and it didn't quite hit me like it did this week. The Holy Spirit, I've heard the Holy Spirit is a person. And a little bit of you is like, okay. Because, and maybe not for you, but for me, there's a connotation when it comes to person that makes you think human. So then we're going back to taking this the God and trying to put him in the human box by saying he's a person. But that's not what we're talking about. We're t- we're, what I'm telling you is, is I would submit that most of the Christians, not only in this building, but in churches throughout our country and probably throughout the world, uh, have missed this aspect of the Holy Spirit. And that this Holy Spirit is the often forgot and underutilized member of, of the Godhead. But the Holy Spirit is a distinct personal being. Otherwise, why did at the beginning they said, they didn't just say God was floating over the, the expanse? And, or why at the end did they not say, and God was shouting, or even Jesus, right? They, they left them distinct from the very beginning to the very end of the written record that we base our faith on. The Holy Spirit's a distinct personal being. I've got some evidence for you here that it, it may or may not help, but Take some notes, or you'll be able to check out the slides online later in the stream. The personal nature of the Holy Spirit is shown, in, first of all, in his titles. He's a comforter. He's a helper. There, there's a personal aspect to that. Do you know that you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you? Do you ever do that? And, and, and maybe the words, maybe say, God help me and Holy Spirit help me. It's not like a necessarily a combination that unlocks the safe. Oop, Will said, God, we're not helping him. Right? I, I don't think that's the case. But to be honest, what I would present to you is that most people, when we think of the powerful and reachable God, it's like, God, help me. Is that fair to say? How co- and then how come God doesn't speak to me and you're on the mountaintop and you're kind of waiting for the voice from heaven to come down? Will do this or don't do that, Right? And it's not happening. So the personal nature of, of God is, or of the Holy Spirit is so important. So what I'd present to you, there's a big difference between saying, God, help me, and Holy Spirit, I, I need your help. So there's a big difference. And then also this, because... Anyone else feel like circumstances just are, I don't want to curse it, guys, but the circumstances of life are just never always going to line up in your favor. Is that fair to say? It's just, there's no way, even if God's good, the circumstances of this life are just not going to line up in a way that everything is smooth sailing all the time. It's not what Jesus said. It's not what he said he left us with. But in spite of that, he still left us with his peace. And why that is, is because you and I aren't like, God, I'm struggling, help me. 
God, I have uh, this sin addiction. Help me. God, this relationship is falling out. Help me. And then you get crickets. So you're like, okay, I'll do it myself. Right? This is the North American Christian life. And, And it shouldn't be. This has been my life. Instead of like, Holy Spirit... Help me. And then you don't look upward, you look inward. And I think about the bad example, you know, like my kids, man, 17, 14, 12, they've seen me go, God, help me. And then, well, I'll have to figure out something. Instead of, wow, this circumstance, like Holy Spirit, like I said, maybe, maybe, maybe that's weird, but like maybe you need to say, you, you feel more doctrinally sound if you'd say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, help me. It's not a formula to that. It's a relationship. But, but, but maybe if what you were given and what I was given when the circumstances are not going our way, instead of pouting, which I do, or getting angry, which I've done, or trying to will it myself to happen, if I come before the Holy Spirit, who's the helper, like, help me, Lord, because there's other people involved that I can't control. But like me, what Brandy and I, man, the beautiful thing about what we've done in our last 21 years of marriage is we've come a long way in this, that like her ability to love me and mine to love her is actually becoming less about how we treat each other, if this makes sense. It's more about that. What it's becoming more is like, Holy Spirit, help me to love her. Her Holy Spirit helped me to love him. And with my kids, it has to be that way. Help me to love them as they need it because I need to change in order to be the husband that she needs. And so, but Holy Spirit, like, help me change so I can be that for her. And Holy Spirit, help me just to love them, and then any change you got, that's the Holy Spirit's, right? If there was a checklist, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He's the changer of me. He's the changer of her. He's the changer of you. But instead, what we've done is, God, help me, and then what can I do? What can I do? How's that feel when I do that, Brandy? Not good, right? What's, what kind of words do, would you use to describe that, like when I act that way? What, what, can I, what can I do to make it better? Because I, I, annoying. annoying, that's a good word. That's a powerful word. And so a lot of us, uh, can I borrow that? Is that good? Okay. So annoying, like our, spe- our lo- living with God, right, is annoying because we're just nagging the world to do what we want it to do. We're freaking out. We're nervous. We're far from peace because we're sitting here, God, help me. It's even something people don't believe in God. God, help me. God, save me, right? Like now I believe in God, but the rest of the time I don't. And then you wonder why it's, it's crickets. So the Holy Spirit is, is personal. He's the comforter, the helper. God the Spirit applies the work of Jesus the Son. Regeneration, renewal, rebirth, that's all him. That's him. He accomplishes the unified will of the Father and the Son while being in a personal relationship with both of them. I don't know. Right? But apparently he knows what's going on in spiritual realms that I don't. Because each one of you, like it or not, it's interesting to to think about, you are all more than the physicality and the mental, right? You're you're this body, right? Spirit and soul. If you want to break it down into three, like the personality and some of the soul stuff, right? You you have, there's a spirit to you. Like I like to think of it in four terms, like like you think you are your body, there's a physicality to you, right? Aches, ugh. And then there's a spirit, this eternal part of you that will never die. And then the soul, which is really confusing because part of it seems to be like part of your forever and then part of it's your personality, right? And then there's your mind, the, the thoughts that you have. So there's like this body, spirit, and soul. Well, everything that's going on in the spirit, the Bible tells us you can't use your mind to understand the spirit. The only way you can understand the spirit is by spirit. Who could know the spirit of who could know the mind of God, the will of God, but the spirit of God is what it says. 
So if you want to know what's going on in the spiritual realm around you, if you want to know what's going on in the heavens, if you want to know what God's up to, what Jesus is up to, the Spirit is, it has to be the one to tell you. And he can tell, and you can get that into your mind as one, but until it, spin, it penetrates to the permanent part of you that is eternal, right, until the Spirit, and your Spirit is changed, you won't change. So no wonder we feel so insane. We're trying to use our mind to understand spiritual things. It'll drive you crazy. That's like trying to run a marathon on your hands, right? And then another interesting fact, okay, for like the people who love the brainiac part of it, um, you know what a pronoun is, right? So in the scriptures, and there's good evidence for why they translated this way, everywhere it talks about the Holy Spirit, they use the pronoun he, not it, he, he is personal. Matthew 28, 19, like he's given separate names and Jesus said go out into all the world, right, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. United yet distinct. And then it says things like we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved? That's a personality thing. And the Spirit can be sinned against, Isaiah 63, 10, and lied to, Acts 5, 3, We are to obey him, Acts 10, 19 through 21, and honor him, Psalms 51, 11. These are very personal traits. So if you want to believe what the Bible is teaching you, you can no longer go on believing that this is some ooh, spirit thing I don't want to mess with or some kind of magician to help you do tricks so that you feel close to God. It's, he's neither one of those. The personhood of the Holy Spirit is also displayed in his many works. So we know that he was personally involved in creation. We just showed that. He empowers God's people. Zechariah 4, 6. He guides us. Romans 8, 14. He comforts John 14, 26, which we read. Convicts John 16, 8. Teaches John 16, 13. Restrains sin. Isaiah 59, 19, and gives commands, Acts 8, 29. A mere force, thing, or idea could not do these things. A little bit more. The Holy Spirit's attributes also point to his personality. The Holy Spirit has life. Romans 8, 2. Has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Is omniscient right? Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. Is eternal, Hebrews 9, 14, and omnipresent. He's all-knowing and everywhere, Psalms 139, 7. So have I beat you over the head with Bible verses so that you, I made my point? Okay. Well, and I hope I've, I've made the point that God asked me to say is I, I think each one of us should re-examine ourselves. This, you know, the Bible here, it, it's a resource to us, but most of this is just good reminders that le in letters written to, in the New Testament, good reminders written in letters to believers, things they already knew. And so when I come here, I feel good about reminding you of things you might already know. And I trust that the Holy Spirit knows, and today is the day you need to be reminded of that. And so what I'm presenting to you today is I want you to c reconsider how you approach the Holy Spirit. I would invite you to join me because I'm going to go on a journey. And I trust that the Holy Spirit, which this is weird too, you ready? The Holy Spirit, His power, only through Him will I be able to know Him. Weird. Right? It's like up to Him for me to know Him and accept Him and trust Him and follow Him. And as he transforms me, then my decisions will, will go with that. So I invite you to do that. Um, something Christians love. You guys know, if I said Galatians 5, 22 through 23, what would you say? If you've been in church for a while, you're like, yeah, fruit of the Spirit. 
this is great, right? We preach it. It's like, but the fruit of the Spirit, which, who's the Spirit? Holy Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So everyone in this camp with all the like, be good and behave yourself is like, right on, Will. That's right. What we need to do is just stop doing these bad things. Be reserved, right? Be faithful, be steadfast, do the right thing. No, I'm not going to clap in church or dance, and I, I'm honestly offended you're not wearing shoes right now, right? That's, that's where they're at in this because what we've been taught and taught each other is like what the Spirit wants you to do is do these things. Get your checklist, put it on your refrigerator. Was I, did I have joy today? Brandy, did I have love today? Like, that's my goal. I wake up, be these things, okay? Now, then we got another section, 1 Corinthians 12, and, and this is really, as I've come to know it, are, there's nine gifts of the Spirit, and these are manifestation gifts. So this is something the Holy Spirit gives you, it's some of his work. And these are word of knowledge, word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy, the gift of faith the gift of healings, the working of miracles, the discernment of spirits, different kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Now, everyone right in this camp that we were talking about earlier, like, right on, preach it. You can come speak in tongues with me right now, right? That's that's what you're thinking, or like, let's do some healings, let's do a revival, let's get a tent, let's do it, right? I love you and I'm with you. But, but, but don't forget about Galatians 5. And so you guys need to not forget about Galatians 5 because most of the time, it isn't like tongues of fire coming down and the dead being raised. Sometimes it's self-control. And how do you do that, right? Like you're, right? And, and this, there, there's, thing, there's terms anyway. I don't even want to get into that. But there's terms that you would do and people would do this and they'd say they were doing it in the name of the Spirit. And to everyone over here, it's like, that seems really out of touch with self-control. And, and it is, because there's a time for that. It's a manifestation for that moment, if it's legit. Not everything that's done by people in the name of God is legitimate, right? I.e. the Crusades. Okay, so anyway, let's just do, we do things that God doesn't want us to do because our flesh, our emotion, our need to feel close to him. So I can be the person who, who hears, who has a prophetic gift, but I might not every day have a word for somebody. Is that fair? Now, the other camp over here, they're like, yeah, Galatians 5, way to tell them, Will, right? Way to tell them. Get this. No, you over here, do you believe you could pray and someone could be healed? I don't know, Will. I don't know if that happens. Where where did you get that, that that doesn't happen anymore? In the last days, right? Up to the very end, there's things going on. That's not to say, my friend here, because I I was with you, right? I was with you here. This is what I was probably taught when I was first. I was a little bit nervous about all that. I was taught these things, you know, the gifts will cease, and I, I get it. But if you don't have that, that power of God, man, you have cut your foot off again. I need you, because you know about self control to know when, by the Holy Spirit, I need to pray that this person gets healed and to believe that it would happen. And you guys, don't just make your feelings well up so you feel good and close to the Holy Spirit. Like, every time I've got to do something, right? Like, dance around, hallelujah. Maybe God wants you to, but just because every time the music goes, this is what I do, might not be the right reason to do that, right? On the other end, swing your hips a little bit over here, right? Maybe a little hallelujah, help the pastor out right? Are, are we, you guys see where I'm coming from? What I want is I'm like, God, please, can some of us stop fighting and be united and say, I love it, man. And like, as a believer, it's not about what I do. This church has to be you. No offense, but if this church sucks, it's really, I mean, it might be my fault as a leadership, but it's your fault for not being the church. And when someone's sick, no one's praying for them, like God could heal When we're celebrating, nobody's dancing. Shame on you. Shame on all of us for both of those things. Because the Holy Spirit that we're going to go on this journey to know is both of those things. Is both 
of those things. And why all I want to give you today to chew on, I know it's a long time because I speak too many words. Um, let me give you this picture of this tree. This is the next slide there. You might not be able to see it, what it is. It's, it's a young apple tree. Observation about that, there's no apples on it right now. And I have two of these at my house. This is not the one. I have two of these at my house, and there's no apples on them yet. But Brandy and I have to pay a lot of attention to these things. What, what's really happening is we're developing a relationship with this tree in a way, right? I've got to water it, you know. I guess you're supposed to sing to it. I haven't really done that too much, but I'm thinking about it. But, but you have fertilizer. They make all these different things, and then you have to prune it, and you freak out because you're, like, you're pruning it, and you're like, did I kill that thing? Right, you guys know, anyone who's had trees, it takes all this time to develop a relationship, and ultimately what I'm hoping is going to happen is what? Apples. Apples. That it's going to, in church words, bear fruit. Right? I should, right? I should go pre- practice my sermons to it. And that maybe it'll help, or it'll die. I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. Um, but what, what I want to present to you, why it's so important to realize that the Holy Spirit's a person, and if I was in control and had a magic wand, I'd want every one of you to spend time with the Lord and say, okay, Lord Jesus, like, I, I know you, but I feel like I don't know the Holy Spirit like I need to. And so I'm, I'm stumbling through life, and I want to give you all the wrong things I learned about it, or even the right things. I want to give you everything I've learned about the Holy Spirit, and I want you to teach me new so that it's all right and correct and fresh. What I want, and I would love to display the fruits of the Spirit at all times. When I watch Jesus, I feel like he was able to flow in and out of all the gifts and utilize the fruit whenever he wanted but he never would have been able to do that if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. Because he had to tend to the relationship, just like me and my trees. If I want my trees to bear fruit, I have to have a relationship with the source of that fruit. The only way to enjoy the fruit is to have a relationship with the tree. So where where do we start, Lord? Well, in that metaphor, the fruit is is the gifts. You know, not no not only um, the the manifestation gifts in a moment, but the the actual spiritual gifts as far as like as far as the gifts that are put into you of personality and and gifts of role and gifts of all these purposes that that are more sustained over time as opposed to a spiritual gift in a moment. I want all those things for all of you. I also would love your lives to demonstrate all the fruit of the Spirit. But your ability to do any of those things has to be fed by the power of the Holy Spirit and has to come from your relationship. We're living with these baby apple trees that we never water, never watch, and then we get upset when there's no fruit. Yeah. What's that? Continue? Oh, it's in you? Yep. Yeah, you hear that? he said it's in you. It's in you. The Holy Spirit. I'm excited about what God's going to teach us. I'm excited about how the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to be more one with him and the Father. And some of you, that was like, oh, that was kind of light and weak. Why didn't you do something? I, I get it. That's why I don't want to give it, I, we can't go over everything today, but I give you this one piece, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And I think once you get that, then you're going to be open to the fact that 
that based on what the scripture says, all of us who belong to Jesus have been given this gift. We have the option to utilize the Holy Spirit or not, right? And there's all these other things that we'll get into about how that works. But the Holy Spirit is in you, and if you ignore it, don't acknowledge it, and don't foster a relationship with him, like, he's going to have no power in your life. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, have the worship team come up, and let's just pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your work. I thank you for your words that were recorded. Father God, I thank you that you have a will and a plan, and I know I know that nothing's been thwarted with all of our failures as mankind and all the issues we see with our, our planet and our politics and our health right now. None of those things took you off guard. And Jesus, you have the power and the authority on hev- in heaven and on earth, and you have won the victory against our enemy. You have taken down the fence between us and the Father, Lord. You have torn down sin and death and conquered it. And now you're inviting us through the Holy Spirit who lives in each one of your children, everyone who believes, Lord, and that what we have to do is, is just receive that and surrender to that power. Lord, teach us more about this in the coming weeks, but today we just we sit and we dwell on this piece first of all, that we want to know and we want to experience the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's an important part of our inheritance. And so, Jesus, I just pray that you would, those of us who are a little nervous about that, that you would kind of usher this in. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill us with you anew and afresh as you command the disciples just to be filled and to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we're going to pray. And I know there's some people in the back willing to pray with people, and there's people praying for our service so Holy Spirit we just surrender I surrender my authority as pastor here and I give you free reign over this place Lord to work in the hearts of people that you love that you created and Holy Spirit I pray that you would do what only you can do that you would apply this tremendous work and power from our God that you would take up residence in us Lord that Spirit you would you would lead us and guide us and convict us and comfort us and help us and heal us, making us new. We just praise you and we love you. And we're grateful we can come to you because of what you've done, Lord Jesus. And in your name and power we pray. Amen.